Good afternoon to our audience here in Stockholm. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our on online audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here in Stockholm and a pleasure to have the audience that is following us online. On behalf of our co-conveners, co uh, Ashoka Atri, uh, Rain Matter, uh, the Fundación FEMSA and the Inter-American Development Bank, I want to welcome you to this third session of the seminar that is Tools uh, for Valuing eco Ecosystem Services and Nature-Based Solutions. Uh, this is the third session that we're organizing. Uh, as of today, research indicates that by 2050, more than 20 trillion is going to be the amount that, nat that the climate change or the toll that climate change will put in our world. That is the whole GDP of all Europe that is also somewhat equivalent to the whole GDP of the United States. And that number today, it's not a surprise given the news that we're hearing almost on an everyday basis when where Pakistan is estimated that the floods that had been happening there is going to cost them about $10 billion. Uh, and like that, we can go on and on and on uh, in the United States and the area of Nevada, Las Vegas is having a serious drought for many years. And at the same time, the area of Mississippi is having terrible floods. In Latin America, the northern part of Mexico, it's having a heavy drought as, uh, as well as Chile. Uh, so the governance, the protocols, the norms uh, that we designed do not belong to the new norm. And after the IPCC report, uh, we know that uh, mankind has affected the climate cycle and we need to shift gears and to rethink our governance, our protocols, our, 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 our engineer. And in that, nature-based solutions have proven to be extremely effective in, co in, 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 in combating, in adapting and, and mitigating the effects of climate change. In the first session that we had last week, uh, we dipped into solutions, technologies, different ways, different mechanisms to measure and evaluate ecosystem services, ecosystems, as well as nature-based solutions. Uh, in the session that we had this morning, uh, we talked about solutions. And the main takeaways of that session is that we need to focus not on the solution that is available, because this is not a cookie cutter solution belong to every specific ecosystem, to every specific basin, uh, and that we have to focus on the problem, where the problem is. Ask the four whys, why, 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 so that we get to the, to, to the real problem, so that we can identify, identify the right solution. But that the solution is not going to be in identifying well the problem and the solution, but in the implementation of the nature-based solutions that we choose and that the, the right combination is going to be green and gray, that it's not everything green, uh, as it's proven that it's not everything is gray. And here we come to this third session in which um, we're going to explore the way forward. And in the way forward, we have the, the privilege to have uh, Dr. Kate Berman. Uh, she will moderate this session. She is the Associate Director for Analysis and Communication at the Global Water Security Center at the University of Alabama. Yeah, Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It is really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit trying to set the stage for the way forward and issues that we might think about. And I hope that mostly what this talk does is get you excited about the questions you want to ask, because we have a really amazing panel, and that's what most of this session is for, is bringing some folks from around the world who are thinking about what does it actually mean to put these um, nature-based solutions and valuing nature into practice, and to, to push that forward, to think about where are we going next, what are the issues that we're not thinking about, um, and how do we wrestle with, with really addressing those issues um, so that we can move forward? Um, so I encourage you to you know, be spending this time thinking about your great questions, and I will kick it off. Um, so you know, we're talking about valuing nature, and that's something that has really been on the agenda of late. 
Um, and really over the last 10, almost 20 years, there's been reports that have come out. Um, there's both national and subnational approaches to trying to put this into legislation. Um, there's certainly been news articles, all kinds of things. And in fact, you're here, right? We're in the third session of Evaluing Nature seminar at World Water Week. Clearly there is interest in this. And that's fantastic, but I think one of the things that's really important is that when we talk about valuing nature, what we're really talking about is thinking about being explicit about how do we actually get to what we mean? What, what are we actually talking about when we talk about valuation? So that means that we really need to think about how do we systematize these questions? Um, how do we quantify the things that we care about? And you know, really what that boils down to is how do we account for the things that we care about? It's actually a non-trivial question. Um, I may be an academic, but I swear this is relevant uh, lar larger than that and beyond that. So if we think about sort of a, a basic uh, diagram, we know that nature affects people. And so we're trying to like wrap up this whole thing in the middle as nature's benefits to people or ecosystem services. Um, but of course, when we talk about that, we're not just talking about wild nature, we're talking about nature that we live in, that we are very much a part of. And so this is managed as well as unmanaged systems, terrestrial and marine, and really all of the ways that they affect people. So why do we wanna do this? Well, we're here and we're talking about value because most of the time, what we're really thinking about is feedback loops. If we know that nature affects people, and we know that people affect nature, then we can think about all kinds of new approaches to conservation and the potential for new and different ways for um, us to manage these complex biophysical social systems um, and potentially get lots more good stuff out of this. Um, so you've probably heard about lots of these different things this week already and in these sessions already. and. Um, I wanna talk about them because they're really exciting. We've had, I think, some really great uh, positive, uh, we've been selling these things. So that's fantastic. And I would also argue to you that there's, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of knowledge gaps that we still have. And there's a lot of perils in especially the implementation of this. And if we don't address those, ooh, I think my mic just disappeared. <laughs> oh, oh, we're back. Um, if we don't address those, then we're not gonna get the kind of benefits that we want out of these systems. So I wanna talk about three things, um, the flow of water and the flow of water to start with, because of course that's what we're here for, it's World Water Week. Um, but I wanna talk about the flow of information in systems like this. And I wanna talk about values and how values imbue these kinds of projects that we're talking about when we talk about valuing nature and valuing nature-based solutions. So let's start with water, because we're here to talk about water. And, you know, we know that nature-based solutions absolutely can be effective. Many of us have seen this in practice. We've certainly read about it. Um, there's a ton of potential there. And we also know that nature-based solutions are not a panacea. They're not going to fix everything. So here just said, we need to think about green-gray together. Um, we really need to think about what's happening when we put these kinds of projects into place. So let me take you to the United States. Uh, this is a picture of Houston. In uh, 2017, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston very, very hard. This was a really big hurricane. There was a lot of flooding. And we are talking about over a meter of rain within 24 hours. That is a lot of water. <laughs> a lot of times when we're talking about nature-based solutions, we're talking about small scale local interventions. And so one of the things that we really need to start talking about in a serious way is scale. Because we're never gonna see the kind of impact that we want if we're not talking about measuring and balancing the scale of the kind of problems that we're facing and that we're facing as climate change becomes a more and more important issue and the scale of a lot of the solutions that we're talking about it really doesn't actually matter how much of any of these things you have if you have a meter of rain falling. And so we need to think about nature-based solutions within a larger system, and we need to be honest about what they're capable of delivering. We're still in Houston here. What you're seeing, all the colored dots on this slide are 
where wetlands were and are in Houston. The red ones have been converted, the green ones are still in existence. We talk a lot about wetlands and flood control. We also need to talk about the fact that wetlands exist in places where it's wet. And when it rains, those places remain wet. And when we put people in those places, they get wet. And thinking about really what is the topographic, the geographic, the climatic setting of the nature-based solutions we're talking about and what's possible is again really important. Um, also, all of these wetlands, even, under a, a, even with wetlands under a meter of rain, you're still uh, pretty saturated. <laughs> um, and finally, something that I think we all know, but it's easy to forget when we're talking about the potential of nature-based solutions is that in the real world, ecosystems are complicated. It's easy to say forest restoration, mangrove restoration, wetlands, some sort of perfect picture or schematic of what it could be. And yet, in real life, these ecosystems are, are quite complicated. This is a this is a real forest that this is a picture of. And that's just a hiking trail through the middle. And we know that water flows preferentially and that in real life, when we have ecosystems and nature-based solutions, we really have to think about how they're used, um, all of the details of what's happening in them in order to understand what the impacts of these things are going to be. And so, you know, when we talk about nature-based solutions and we talk about nature-based solutions for water and valuing nature, there is more that we need to know. We need to think about um, the specifics of the context. We need to do more measuring and monitoring. We need to look at these projects as they grow in scale and try to understand you know, what all the different hydrologic flows are in them. There's a tremendous amount that we don't know, and we don't know because we haven't studied it before. We've put a lot of money and a lot of years into understanding how gray infrastructure functions, and we're not gonna get a free lunch with nature-based solutions. We're gonna need to invest in understanding how they function. All of which may sound like I'm you know, being a downer and telling you that we don't have enough science, we can't do anything. But that is not what I am here to say, actually. And so I really wanna talk about information and the flow of information, because it turns out that in almost all cases, even though there is a lot that we don't know, we also don't need to know everything in order to put these programs into place and in order to really you know, start scaling up nature-based solutions. So what is the right information? What's the information that you actually need to know uh, if you wanna have a good, scientific, credible, nature-based solution value of nature? I want you to think about three things. And one of them that you probably already think a lot about is credibility. How good is that model? How many measurements have we made? Sort of the science stuff. Um, and while I do love me some measuring, monitoring, and modeling, I would argue to you that we pay way too much attention to that. We've talked a lot about this here at World Water Week. I've seen super cool data products. I love data. It's not always what we need when we need to make a decision. I think we pay too much attention to credibility, and instead we need to think about some other aspects of information that make it usable and used. So, you know, when we talk about decisions, we really need to think about what is the decision that's actually being made. Um, even in the context of just a single water fund, we've identified at least five different decision contexts that require very different information. And the vast majority of them basically need to know directionality. Like, is this gonna help or hinder? Maybe magnitude. It's really only when you get into the evaluation phases and potentially some of the funding phases where you need later funding phases where you need more specific information. And even in those cases, we have frequently heard people say, well, as long as it's generally positive, we, we need to do something anyway, so let's do this. Um, that much of that really detailed information that it feels like we need isn't actually um, what motivates a lot of the, the putting in place of a lot of these programs. The other thing is that if you actually talk to people about what they want out of nature-based solutions, the answers are many and varied, only some of which are actually related to water. So I won't make you read all of this, but I will say that we really need to focus on salience. 
we really need to focus on what are the actual benefits that actual people in specific contexts want? And how can we make measurements? How can we understand what we need to do in order to answer that question? We don't need, I mean, I'm telling you, I would love to understand the perfect universe of all things about these projects, but we don't actually need to know that in order to implement them, in order to figure out if they're the right projects for the right places. And finally, we really need to think about legitimacy because if people don't trust you, if they don't trust information, they're not going to use it. So you might have the most perfect, beautiful computer model ever. And if you made assumptions to build that, that don't jive with what the folks who actually care about the outcomes <laughs> care about, no one's gonna use your model. If you are coming in and telling people what they need to do without explaining where it is that you've done measurements, how you've decided these things, if you haven't worked with people, that information is not gonna get used and these projects aren't gonna get built. And we need to not underestimate the value that comes out of working with stakeholders, both to understand what it is they need and in the process of understanding that to make the information that we're developing about the value of nature and about nature-based solutions to actually make that information legitimate. So of course, you know, when we talk about information that is salient and legitimate, there's, there's a big piece of that that's really under the underlying part of what makes that salient and legitimate is values. The values that the people who we're working with hold and the values that we hold. Um, every single one of us as individuals and us as part of the organizations that we're part of, and it informs all of the choices that we make as well as the interests of the folks who we're working with in places where we think about putting projects into place. So, you know, I showed you this like perfect feedback mechanism where it's like, oh, you know, nature affects people and people affect nature and we can, you know, do this. But of course, it's much more complicated than that. Um, to really simplify the complexity, we'll just say that all of this is, of course, happening in the context of human systems. Um, and so, you know, for example, when we talk about something like a payment for ecosystem services project, we often talk about them as being a pretty simple transactional project. I'm gonna compensate someone upstream, they're gonna do something, better water's gonna come downstream, it's gonna pay for itself, there's a return on investment. But we know that these projects occur within a super complicated institutional governance framework. Um, this is actually specifically for water funds, but I think that it speaks more broadly to the fact that I'm not actually just paying the person who lives, you know, up the hill from me for doing something. I'm operating within a larger system. And if we don't pay attention to what these larger systems look like and where the pressures to participate, to not participate, um, the different kinds of compensation we're willing to provide or able to provide, that all of these things are really part of the same system and they inform the values and they inform the way that we think about projects. Values, of course, also make a big difference when we talk about what are we actually trying to do with a nature-based solution. So one of the things we've been talking about a lot is flooding, right? Um, nature-based solutions for flooding. Well, you know, flood, a flood is is just a description of water that comes up above the bank, right? That's a biophysical thing that happens in nature. Um, it's not good, it's not bad, it just is. Usually when we say we care about flooding, what that means is we care about people. We care about inundation. So I'll simplify this by saying, you know, we care about whether or not your feet are wet. <laughs> okay. We care about whether your feet are wet. That's, that's, the, that's the benefit that we're interested in. And this like biophysical phenomena is, you know, Where's the water? What's happening with the water? Well, whether or not my feet are wet actually is largely a function of whether or not there's water on the ground, right? So that's where so much of this vulnerability comes into place. Do I live in a place where there's water on the ground? But it also is really important, especially when we think about nature-based solutions, because we can have nature-based solutions that are actually doing a very good job of abating flooding and still have water on the ground. 
they can be making things better, but not perfect. And if what I care about is whether my feet are wet, that might not be good enough, or I might not understand that there's something happening. And even when we sort of break apart those, those two things, the environmental conditions, whether it's wet, from what nature is doing, what kind of benefits nature is providing, when we think about, well, what are we gonna measure? How are we gonna quantify this? What's the thing we're gonna value? Then, well, are we measuring how much potentially might happen? This is what could happen if we had a big flood, a small flood, or are we talking about what has happened, what did happen? And this is important, especially when we think about water quality. If I'm not putting anything in the water, then nature's not taking anything back out, right? It could, but it's not. So what are we deciding to value? And I think there's very good reasons for measuring and monitoring for doing evaluation exercise on, quite frankly, any of these four things. But you're gonna get different answers when you do. And that's not bad, but it does matter. And it's full of the values that ourselves and our organizations have when we make decisions about what it is that we're going to value, what it is that we actually care about. And that also really matters when we think about this what are we valuing? What do we, what do we really care about when we think about substitutions and what substitutions are acceptable? If what I really care about is dry feet, maybe I just need some nice rain boots. And this, I think, is one of the places where when we talk about nature-based solutions, we often come into conflict with folks who are more focused on people who are more focused on development and also where I think we can find some common ground to understand that all of these things do matter and they're different and that's okay, but that we're part of this system and all of the different pieces are able to work together. And I also want to note that when we talk about values, of course, it's very important <laughs> to think about what this feedback mechanism is because the feedback mechanism is a big part of why we're doing this valuation in the first place. We want to quantify what's the value of a nature-based solution so that we can think about feeding that back and think about compensation. So again, we come to our like perfect, pretty, uh, simple explanation of what is a payment for ecosystem services. We have compensation moving upstream. We have benefits moving downstream. I have worked with water funds that had more money than they could spend because they could not get people to participate in these programs. It's not just about money, which isn't to say that money doesn't matter, <laughs> um, but it's a much bigger picture than that. And when we've spent time talking with folks who are participants in these programs, they're almost always talking about what are the things that I care about? How do I relate to the land? How does this affect me in my place as well as people downstream? Do I trust the intermediary who I'm working with? Um, there's a whole constellation of, of relational values that are involved in this, um, and trust ends up being a really big issue. And so I want to end just by saying about values. Um, if you're not familiar with IPBES, which is the um, intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, I highly recommend you take a look at it. I was part of the global assessment that was released in 2019, but just this summer, the plenary um, accepted and passed a new, uh, a new assessment of methodology evaluation. And they put together this really fantastic image along with a few others that really emphasizes that there are different knowledge systems, there's different ways of understanding the world that if you follow through and think about what those ways of understanding the world are, you pick different indicators of value that you want to measure. And so when you say this is the value of a nature-based solution, you're looking at an indicator, and the indicator that you choose is going to differ <laughs> depending on what your worldview is, depending on what it is that you, that you value and what you're interested in doing. So, you know, values really permeate <laughs> all of the pieces of 
of these systems. And that you know, sounds a little bit trite since the entire title of this was valuing nature, um, but we really do need to think about what our values are when we think about how we go about the process and the tools for valuing. So, you know, we've been talking about water, information, value, and how those all fit together. So I'll close by coming back actually to this idea of information and credibility, salience, and legitimacy, because I think they really um, mirror these big topics. So yes, there is more science that we need to do. There is more measuring and monitoring that we need to do. Um, one of the things that I am so excited about seeing is that as more and more projects, especially um, some projects in Peru that I've been talking about this week, are being put into place that big scale measuring and monitoring is part of building those projects. But that's not enough. Um, we really, again, need to think about salience. What do we care about? What are we actually, what are the parts that we're measuring and monitoring? Um, because we're not, we don't have the time or the money or the energy to, to measure everything. So understanding what are the right questions and how do we get the information to answer those questions is a huge part of the upfront investment in these projects. And finally, you know, the legitimacy of them. I do feel great about the fact that more and more um, I hear people talking about upstream participants and the values and interests of folks upstream beyond just compensation, but I think we also need to be a lot more explicit about our own values and why it is that we're making the choices to measure and monitor and do valuation about the things that we are doing valuation exercises on. So I will end there. Thank you very much for listening through this. I hope that it left you with lots of questions for our panel. So um, first I wanna introduce our two panel members who are going to be online. Uh, William Van Derzen is the owner of Carthage Consultancy. And Mr. Van Derzen has been working throughout the world as a modeler and a planner for water projects. Um, he's got a strong focus on future water management and modeling and challenges, and also on um, interactions between biophysical management of water issues and the socioeconomic issues that surround them. Um, Dr. Peace Sasha Liz Musange is the program manager for Aquavia, Aquaya. I said that wrong. Um, Dr. Peace has expertise in water quality and biomonitoring, and she's currently working on a USAID uh, project called Real Water, um, cited in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. She's a member of the Advisory and Policy Committee at the Our World Heritage Foundation and the Organization for Women in Science in the Developing World. So both Peace and Willem are online with us today. We also have two panelists here in person. Um, so Hannah Ben is the Engagement Manager for Pegasus and the Nature for Water facility. And she's an economist specializing in socially and ecologically sustainable development. She's worked throughout Africa using economic analysis and valuation to build innovative finance solutions. You can come on up. <laughs> and Harsh Sheth is the senior manager for corporate water stewardship at WWF Sweden. And he works with companies including H&M, AstraZeneca, Gant and Gina Tricot in their water stewardship journeys. He's worked on renewable energy, management consulting, industrial resource efficiency, and water governance. And everybody's got, I think, some really great perspectives on all of the things that we're talking about today. So we have about an hour for this panel. Um, I have a few questions that I've queued up to uh, make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk and that we definitely hit some provocative issues. That was my brief today. But I really hope that you also will ask a lot of questions because I'm excited about all of the folks on our panel. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Peace, I'd like to start with you. And, you know, we're talking about valuing nature today, and so much of that hinges on the assumption that doing some kind of valuation is going to change actions. 
And I'm curious if you think that's true and if there's pathways that, you, that you've seen in your work or your organization um, from valuation to change that you've seen in practice. Uh-oh, hold on, we haven't got sound yet. <laughs> nope. You're, you're still muted. Yeah, is it okay? Yeah, sorry, sorry yes. about that. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you, Kate, for that introduction. Yes, I would, I would say that, uh, yeah, sure, uh, I would say it's a yes and no answer because um, yeah, val uh, articulating the value of nature would, would cause some changes in actions to certain specific stakeholders. However, um, for some stakeholders, it would have a negative effect. For example, um, you could see that uh, in the coastal regions, uh, showing the value of nature in, in terms of uh, for recreational activities like beaches has led to a lot of developments and has led to the the degradation of a lot of uh, mangrove forests in the, uh, the coastal regions. And that in a way is a beneficial to the developers and maybe to some governments and certain stakeholders. However, when you look at the local communities that live in these coastal regions, when it comes to like storm surges, as we see how climate change has uh, caused an increase in all these uh, weather, weather activities. So I would say that uh, it, yes, it could have a positive and a negative at the same time. But I believe that also actions depend on goodwill and needs assessment, as you say, that having a needs assessment of the, the, of the different uh, stakeholders uh, would also have a very good uh, way of, of helping us, uh, you know, change and show the value of nature. And as you said, I don't, I, I'm, when you look at value, we have to say value in terms of just not only monetary value, but we also have to look at the social, economic and cultural value. For example, in the area where I worked in, uh, for my PhD in the Renzori Mountains, that's in Western Uganda, uh, interacting with the local communities, there's a tribe, they're called the Bakonjo people. And uh, I, when I was doing my data collection along these different river ecosystems, uh, you could see that they had this, they had this valuation of the systems in, in a spiritual sense. So looking at those cultural values also, should also show us that we need to also articulate uh, the values of indigenous communities only to, to also show that it can also create change and, and also show that the spiritual uh, cultural norms are also very key in showing the value of nature because most people are looking at the monetary value of nature. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hannah, I think you also had some thoughts about sort of what the, what the pathways from valuation to impact are. Yes, thanks, Kate. Um, I do agree with peace. I think before articulating the value, there needs to be a shared vision amongst the stakeholders and a shared idea of what it is that we are going to value uh, for that evidence to be meaningful for everyone. Uh, but I have a good example of where this was done and where it led to uh, really positive action in the Greater Cape Town Water Fund. Um, in the process of designing the fund, uh, the Nature Conservancy and their partners um, undertook some significant hydrological modeling and economic modeling to produce the business case. Um, and the timing of this was also really important because it was around the time that the city of Cape Town were facing it, uh, the highly publicized day zero drought. Um, and it was at a time when several water supply augmentation options were on the table. And so TNC and its partners um, created the business case and were able to compare the cost uh, and water supply increase of several engineering solutions, such as desalination, um, and compared that with nature-based solution, which in the case of the catchments upstream of the city of Cape Town was alien invasive clearing. Um, and alien clearing proved to be considerably cheaper and deliver more water to the city um, over the lifetime of its implementation, which was the ultimate impact and benefit that the stakeholders were united around. And so the va articulating this value was really the evidence that cemented the partnerships between these stakeholders. Um, and in particular, it led to the city of Cape Town becoming the anchor funder for the Greater Cape Town Water Fund in its first phase. So I do think it's important to note that, as we've said before, contexts do differ 
greatly from catchment to catchment. And so we do need to continue building the evidence base to cover the full range of nature-based solutions and the different water security impacts that they might uh, contribute to both water quality and quantity so that we're ready with evidence when the time is right. Harsh, did you want to chime in on this one as well? Yeah, uh, I want to kind of add a filter to my stakeholder group because working with corporate partnerships kind of has been heavy in the last three, four days talking with these corporates. And I, I really want to kind of build off. I, I really thought I had something to sh very concrete to share, but Kate, you killed the buzz in that <laughs> with your whole presentation. I think this process around complex messaging of water and trying to simplifying is not a especially for the corporate stakeholders is where value articulation is is you know being oversimplified or the ask is to oversimplify it and, and my argument there with all of these parties is that yes your actions will change when we articulate the value of nature-based solutions but what is it that you're expecting as the articulation there and if i if i get this right they know how to deal with complexity. We are obsessed with trying to oversimplify this. Uh, most of them see nature-based solutions currently coming through and the value coming through it as if it was you know, some kind of a fixed deposit scheme. We invest money in this, it's going to give us returns over time, right? But what it actually is, is a stock market. There is a fundamental value, yes, that establishes what nature-based solutions could do, could not do. And you know there will be a portfolio of those, but then there is pieces which are yes gonna shift. Just like there is a macroeconomic aspect, there's a macro ecosystem aspect. The, it will shift over time. There will be a sensationalization aspect of it because community behavior, community engagement, local organizations, businesses will shift their models and so on. We just have to accept that complexity and not let that stop us from investing in this. I think. Yes, value articulation is important, but it's, it's as if you said, sometimes you don't need to know everything. We don't need to be data obsessed and insight agnostic. We, we need to be insight uh, specific, that what is it, the insight we're looking for? Is it generally positive, as you said? That's it. So I, I think that's really for the corporate stakeholders and investor communities out there that really that message needs to go through. So I wanna, I wanna draw that out a little bit because Obviously, in many ways, I agree, but the flip side of that is sort of all words and no action. Um, so sometimes we talk about this as greenwashing. Um, it's, it seems really easy to say, like, yes, nature-based solutions. We're going to do this. Look at us. We're such a great corporate water steward. Um, so what do you think about greenwashing? I think I, I, I put my foot on the landmine there. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But when it comes to... Okay, let me articulate this right now. <laughs> Greenwashing is turbulence, I think. Greenwashing does indicate that there is an effort that everyone is trying to put towards achieving something or at least achieving a messaging argument or achieving some kind of a business goal out there, right? The fact is that it's also based on poor foundation or frustration. Both of these are very useful to us because when it's a poor foundation, it's an opportunity for us to engage on that foundation improvement. If it is out of frustration, that's actually enabling us to deal with the urgency of the topic. So yes, greenwashing does happen. Fortunately, in a world that we are going into, we have seen transitions in the last five years, be it across politics or be it across science through environment and so on, things like greenwashing are lasting shorter. They're not lasting as long as they used to. And Part of this is, I'm connecting to one of the other conversations we have had here before uh, in the week. Things are really happening. Things are urgent in the sense that earlier some of our partners, and I, I can be, uh, you know, I can take off the panda pin and I can be unfiltered about it. Some of the partners have always thought about that, okay, I'm doing this risk assessment to know if my operations have an impact on, you know, these watersheds. That's changed. Now they're doing those risk assessments, they're doing those analysis, and that's why also the investor community is buzzing around this, is because whether my assets are affected by these basin and watershed level e events. And that's why these greenwashing pieces are losing value, you know, because businesses about optimization, those tools, good or bad as they existed in the toolbox, are failing to deliver value. So no, greenwashing, 
should not scare us into investing in this. Uh, if we connect it to back to value articulation, it should not stop us from investing in this. Yes, there will be a few bad eggs always. There will be a few bad eggs in the basket always. It's just about sorting them, letting, letting our science and letting our uh, policy process work on that. There's a lot of policy coming up, which is great, right? So uh, yeah, greenwashing, deal with it. We'll deal with it, we have to. All right, well, so that's really focused on, on, on corporates who we think of as the funder, sort of the downstream, a lot of the time people who are affected. Um, but I wanna, I wanna look upstream and Willem, I'm gonna turn to you for this one to really um, say a little bit about environmental justice and nature-based solutions projects and, and what, it, what these projects actually end up meaning in, in practice and when they're successful or not. You're addressing me at the moment, I think. Um, yes, yes, I, I am. I, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear my name. Um, I would really want to take a step back and look a little bit at a broader perspective of nature-based solutions, what we are talking about. And I think we should realize there's always a deeper question behind nature-based solutions. And basically, I think we are dealing with systems where the ultimate goal should always be, do we ultimately uh, improve livelihoods of the people we are talking about? And I think we should realize that in this field, we are basically not water managers. We are not nature-based managers, but we are managing the livelihoods of people. And that means that nature-based solutions is just one of the tools that we have for improving livelihoods of people. And the question, of course, is um, it's not only the short-term um, improvement of livelihoods that we're looking at, but also the long-term um, uh, the long-term improvement of the nature of the uh, livelihoods uh, that puts nature-based solutions i think at a very specific spot in the whole field because it seems to be a tool that we can use to actually improve situations of people and that we can actually make the long-term improvements that we need. So I think the, the whole story is a little bit broader than we are not only looking at nature-based solutions and what are the values of nature-based solutions, but we are looking at the question, what do nature-based solutions bring to the improvement of livelihoods of local people? Peace or Hannah, any interest in chiming in on this one? Um, yes, I, I think I would, uh, I would like to chime in um, um, on what Willem has said. Um, I'll still go back to putting, I think, merging uh, scientific and indigenous knowledge because what, what we see a lot with nature-based solutions, people focus on the complex science, you know, and, and yet they forget that the indigenous communities are the custodians of the environment and they've been practicing these nature-based solutions. So we shouldn't look at nature-based solutions as a new thing as a FAD, I think it would be, it would help to merge the indigenous communities with a bit of science to see how these two can, you can merge and then, you know, help, you know, mitigate different issues like climate change, you know, reducing poverty. So just uh, operating in silos would just affect, uh, so I think merging the indigenous communities with the scientific community, the private sector with the public sector, just merging those two, but not ignoring the indigenous communities who I still believe are the custodians of nature and still practicing nature-based solutions. Thank you. Absolutely. And I wanna pull a thread out of that about climate change. And, you know, we certainly talk about climate and resilience, but um, is climate gonna completely upend the way that we're managing all of these solutions, um, the kinds of nature-based solutions that we're putting into place. How, how have you dealt with that um, in your projects? Um, Peace, do you want to continue and then we'll move to Hannah after that? Um, yeah, yes, I think uh, what I would say in terms of uh, uh, climate change, yes, uh, climate change would upend uh, some of the nature-based solutions. Uh, for example, I would give, uh, when we look at re reforestation, like people are looking at monocultures, 
And we know that climate change is causing these temperature shifts and there's the wildfires and all that. So the, so the type of species that are being planted should be like, you know, native species. We shouldn't look at invasive species because we need to understand the environment, the local context, you know, tailor-made solutions. So you have, the, you don't transplant a certain type of tree species into maybe a certain region in Africa where you know that the climate, you know, the climatic factors are, are, are quite different from maybe the Northern hemisphere. So I think nature-based solutions um, would be appended if they don't factor in like data and understanding, you know, the local context and not do as, as I think, as you had earlier said, there's no cookie cutter solution. So with that, I would say that, um, yeah, yes, nature-based climate change would affect some nature-based solutions. However, I would, I would think to uh, mitigate that we need to match both the gray infrastructure and the green infrastructure. So because we know that as, as um, Dr. Vina had said, uh, time scales, if you're looking at, um, at areas of like tree planting, how long does it take to plant a tree? How long does it need, take to restore a, a wetland? And if you're looking at flood mitigation, can we just match uh, a bit of uh, uh, gray infrastructure and green infrastructure? We can't just you know, work with it separately when it comes to climate change. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hannah. Thanks, Kate. I'm glad Peace uh, touched on implementation. I'm going to focus more on when we design the NBS projects and we're trying to generate the robust e evidence of NBS impact. I've seen two ways that climate change is affecting our work. The first, um, and it relates to the Greater Cape Town Water Fund example I gave, is that climate change is actually presenting a bit of an opportunity because the crisis was happening there and then, and there was urgency and willingness to accept um, innovative solutions and consider NBS more seriously. And so um, it presented an opportunity and uh, the team was able to generate the evidence quickly enough to move with the momentum of the immediate crisis response. However, what we're seeing in other catchments is that climate change will introduce um, a crisis in the future, but we're not sure when that crisis will hit. And so what we're trying to do is understand what are the tipping points in those systems so that we can still generate the same level of robust evidence to show people what the cost of a future crisis would be, but there's uh, less urgency and belief that it will happen, which is quite a big challenge for us. Um, so I think we ultimately just have to keep trying to uh, do more scenario modeling, generate robust evidence so that we're ready when the urgency is there to respond um, with solutions to put on the table and continue to illustrate that the cost of action late or no action at all is ultimately higher than action now. Yes. Willem, I thought I saw you writing up there. Did you want to <laughs> add into this one? Um, yeah, I think there's quite a few things that I would want to add. Um, I definitely think climate change is adding to the challenges that we already have, but climate change is just putting additional pressure on a lot of systems that are already under pressure, that are already challenged by the water. And so local people, local communities do have the long-term experience of how dealing with this kind of um, let's say, uh, physical pressures on their system. Now, climate change steps in and that puts additional pressure on the whole system. And now it becomes interesting because there's local people who have the experience of how to deal with this kind of systems. And at the other side of the spectrum, there seems to be the experts and the researchers who bring in the expertise. And now we need to balance the, the indigenous knowledge, the indigenous experience of local people with the, 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 the input of the experts and of the, the research. But the systems we are dealing with, most of those systems are already under pressure. What climate change does, it, it, it just adds additional pressure to systems that are already uh, challenged and that are already vulnerable.
Arsh, did you want to weigh in on this one also? No, Climate change uh, is such a good this is, topic. Th this is, uh, you know, something that's uh, extremely important, I think, from a design aspect, the aspect of local native indigenous populations and how they know about the basic long-term trends in the landscape and so on. I think there are times when science needs validation from local indigenous knowledge and local indigenous knowledge sometimes needs validation from science. I think that, that process needs to happen. Uh, and you articulate that you know the uh, climate change does uh, represent an opportunity, but I, I'm reflecting on the question from the original design as you know risk from climate change to NBS. And as I said, you know there's if you look at it as stock market, there is a valuation which is driven by macro ecosystem logics and so on. And here comes my pitch. There is something called water risk filter, <laughs> which we built. Uh, we have now included it to have a TCFD aligned framework around doing scenario analysis for water risk. Not just that, in 2023, we are actually aligning, because in the first seminar, we saw that there's other types of values, right? Water is one, biodiversity, landscape, there's lots of values that are associated with NBS. So we are integrating that with our biodiversity work, and we are going to have a biodiversity and water risk filter, so it's going to be a WWF risk filter, uh, just as a common. So I think, yes, there will be an impact. Again, that's a part of the speculation as well as the macro ecosystem change. Uh, I have a person in this room, a, an analyst who works with me a lot, and he always says that all models are wrong, some models are useful. <laughs> and, and we just need to apply those kind of model knowledge to adapt. You know, we need to build a in resilience into N NBS from what we think is known today. And embrace the unknown, that's it. But we need to invest, we need to get started. Well, this is, you know, this speaks to my heart, right? Because this is this big question about what information actually gets used, what information is demanded. Um, and so we've, you know, first I want to turn to peace to ask a little bit about more about indigenous knowledge and in general sort of where you're seeing information being demanded um, and used. And then I would love to hear from the rest of you also, and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. So get those questions ready. Uh, still muted. Yeah, thank you. Um... You know, when it comes to what information is needed, uh, when we look, uh, I'll, I'll tackle the issue with the corporates. Uh, you find that a lot of uh, big conglomerates have uh, have come into uh, uh, um, many areas in Africa, and uh, they kind of they get all these land concessions, and they don't involve uh, the local communities that have been living there in in some of these decisions. And what, what they need to understand is, uh, as we've, uh, we've already articulated, that understanding the, the culture, the environment, um, the, the indigenous science of an area would help, would help these uh, investments and know what the impact is going to be. For example, in a watershed, how it's going to impact the different biodiversity. So I would think that uh, involving uh, like the grassroots, okay, what I would call grassroots participation, or in from the start of uh, an, an implementing and then to the investment step would be quite crucial to understand the local context and see how these investments would affect you know the bigger picture because there will be multiple benefits from the local community, the government, the and also the the the, the, the corporate organization. So uh, involving. Uh, uh, these uh, local communities and helping them document because a lot of this information is like you know oral tradition, just word of mouth. So have, helping them document this would would also help you know put some you know put some more emphasis on their knowledge than just word of mouth because as we said we are building this evidence base. Yeah, thank you, Willem. I know you've thought a lot about sort of local context. Do you want to say some more about this? Well, and do we do we still have you there? Yeah, I'm still oh, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about the um, focusing the question on information because if we mean by information. Uh, we um, uh, start then limiting that question to do we have the right computer models and do we feed the right data into that 
computer models and things like that. I think we are losing a lot of the uh, much wider terrain that we should cover. And as uh, Peace is already saying, um, there is, of course, the local knowledge that doesn't seem to make its way into uh, the, the, the official information channels that we have. And basically what we are dealing with is predictions of what will happen in the future. And so there's not too much certainty in that whole field. We have to wait and see what happens tomorrow. But we can, we can see patterns happening and we can see patterns happening both in the physical system where we have the models, but we can also see patterns happening in the social economic systems where we seem to have less models. And we seem to need to balance those stories so that we make up storylines of what is going to, what, what, what could happen in the future, what could um, possibly happening to the future and make and use those storylines to start preparing for the future. The focus on information only is, I think, a little bit too limited perspective. There is a broader uh, field that we need to cover here, and information is part of it, but we don't want to fall into the trap that if we don't have enough information, we cannot mo make these storylines happening. I certainly wouldn't argue with that. Um, Hannah, Harsh? I think there's two main buckets of information that do get used. The first is the burden of proof per stakeholder, the information about the impacts that they will experience directly that will convince them to believe that the in intervention could work to support, to participate, whatever. The other bucket of information is awareness about the broader system that the stakeholders are reliant on. And a lot of the time we've realized that some of the main water users downstream just aren't aware of what's going on in upper catchments. And so lack of awareness of that kind of just photographic information, anecdotal information, um, really changes the way that they engage with, with our proposals. So, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> somehow in my brain, I'm stuck with a joke that we use uh, quite often. When a hydrologist and a psychologist meet and you know they're discussing about what's more complex whether it's predicting the flow of uh, water across the ecosystems versus predicting the behavior of the society and you know the hydrologist goes into explaining everything that could possibly explain and establish complexity the psychologist says well i don't have that much information that's why i think it's not complex uh, you know <laughs> the, the society is not a sum of individuals uh, as we think it should be it, it it acts very unpredictably so just having the unknown <laughs> that's so i think yes we should not just go into the models uh, we should uh, try to bring these two information pieces together so i completely echo that uh, you know all right well i'd like to turn it over to the audience now for some questions um, please use the mic and please introduce yourself when you ask a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for this interesting uh, topic. Um, my name is Abdurrahman Sultan. I'm from EcoPeace Middle East. I come from Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, trying to save the environment and peace over there. And um, I'm thrilled to see the line of thinking about uh, nature-based solution. This is something that we acknowledge. We know that uh, nature-based solution is uh, site-specific. And uh, my worry is when we go into mainstreaming those solutions without the uh, specificity of different locations, uh, the psychological behavior, and so on. So it's, it's a really complex thing that we need to be careful uh, because what happens in the last decades, uh, it's we mainstream so many things, transportation, energy, water supply, etc. And we came to the result that uh, countries like Jordan is not uh, possible to live there without water uh, in the coming few uh, years or decades. So we have to be careful how we mainstream information. The, um, the other point, which is, uh, I, it's not a question, but, uh, it's a comment. When we speak about uh, uh, greenwash, it's like media. And media is good, whether it's with us or against us, it brings attention to what, whatever we have. The, the problem today that I think that is really important that how much information, what is quality of information that we reach to, or we, we have access to, because it's really important that our new, new generation, they're really keen about the environment, 
but they're getting some type of information might be useful, might not be useful to their local uh, condition. And this is something that we need to make sure that we have young leaders within our societies that looking for the right information for their for themselves, not uh, a global scale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did anybody want to respond to any of those? Uh, no, just to agree that uh, nature-based solutions aren't necessarily transferable from context to context. And you really have to uh, understand the problem intimately and the drivers of that problem in that context to design something bespoke. Just if I were to add a layer to that, a, if, if complexity is something that we are really dealing with, we, we as humans and as society have actually dealt with a lot of complex things. So we should not be afraid of, you know, that information being different and nature based solutions being different, in different places. Yes. Even when you build a construction site, it depends on the site. You cannot have the same fundamentals applicable to across how a building is made. There are engineering as well as social and, you know, uh, solutions that we have designed. We've built very abstract tools, you know, think about social networks. We've built very abstract tools out there, which are very complex in their design but we can accept it so we should just embrace that complexity i think we should not try to simplify it we, sh we should just accept it i have a question about which i think either would you be so kind as to introduce yourself oh i'm veena srinivas and i'm also a co-convener of this session but, <laughs> uh, i have a question which which uh, occurred to me when both you spoke as well as something that peace said which was uh, the issue of I'm going to call it co-evolution or unintended consequences. We talk about a lot about this in the socio hydrology space, which is that uh, let's say you've built a nature-based solution, which is a nice nature preserve that you've, you've done. And then now it suddenly becomes so attractive to, to tourists or hotels or whatever, that you have this unintended consequence of, uh, and, and Peace mentioned this, of now attracting new developers. So I was wondering, is the entire space of nature-based solutions kind of time bound that uh, some of it's only going to last 20 years before some kind of unintended consequence uh, kicks in because we're talking about it in a very linear way, right? You build the nature-based solution, you get the benefit forever. But then society co-evolves. And I was wondering if any of you want to speak about ways to either mitigate this or is this a problem or is it a non-problem? Anybody? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I would, I would like to add to okay what Vina said is that I think uh, as we know that uh, ecosystems, for example, ecosystem science and ecosystem services are quite complex. So everything keeps evolving. So with this negative effect, I think we nature-based solutions need to keep evolving with the you know with what society what's happening around society. For example, in, like the example I gave of developers when. Um, when there's like a wetland or that it's now being you know visited by a lot of tourists we could also use a principle like the polluter pays principle maybe we heighten you know the the cost of you know visiting those sites to factor in mitigation costs so they, they could be something like that so i think we should have creative models where we include also financial incentives and and that would also help uh, maybe keep this the time scale of these nature-based solutions so uh, also applying a polluter pays model or visitor pays model to some of these sites that would maybe be over visited or even having the developers also keep changing their kind of uh, developments you know they, you you just you just don't put a concrete block and hope it will last for the next 50 years if it means remodeling so everyone has to keep evolving that's what I would think would help there's no one size fits all so I think it has to keep evolving thank you yeah. I, yeah. I agree with that very much. Willem, I'll come to you in one sec. Um, no. Yes, I mean, I think this is, a, this is a big issue and I'm actually really, really glad to see people talking about it more because I think some of the equity and environmental justice issues that do arise often unintentionally, I mean, I, mean, I might even say always unintentionally and give the benefit of the doubt, um, are very real. One of the things, though, that we've certainly seen in some of the, the water funds that I've worked with in Latin America is that they're never one and done. They're always 
in reality a series of small projects, re-engagements, um, and growth and change. And the water funds that we've seen that have been um, the most durable, the ones that have really stuck around, have managed to stick around because they are responsive to, um, in these cases, it tends to be upstream folks. Um, but I think that the same thing has a lot of potential to be true in urban places and where um, you're looking at the kinds of greening and green gentrification um, that we do know can be a problem. And so I'm hopeful, uh, although I do, I, I'm both hopeful and I think we need to address this head on because otherwise it will be a problem. And the reason that I'm hopeful is that I have seen actual programs in actual places be very responsive, be inclusive, be representational. Um, and so I think it's totally possible, but that doesn't mean that it will happen if we don't really wrestle with it head on. It, I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let yeah. Willem speak first. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we... Um, yeah, um, I think we need to be careful thinking that we can do just one intervention and we solve the whole pro problem. And so we start a nature-based solutions and that will last forever or something like that. I think we are making steps in a very dynamic system in which both society and uh, the, the physical environment are changing and will react to each other. So what we can hope for is that we definitely get the next step as a little bit, um, uh, let's say, a positive uh, attitude towards the problems we are facing. But I'm, I think we should be a little bit humble, not thinking we have the silver bullet and we can change the whole thing. But we are, we are making steps toward uh, progress, towards a better society. It's not the end of it. We need to continue, I think, managing our systems and our relations with uh, nature, with the physical environment. Yeah, just rebutting on that, it's context is not spatial only. Context is time also. So when, when you're designing and implementing NBS, yes, you can adapt to kind of change over time and so on. And yet there will be unintended consequences. And putting this in the way forward context, as in this conversation is about way forward. And from way forward, this not just represents risks, threats, and challenges, but it represents opportunities. The constant need for optimizing your ongoing NBS is an opportunity for employment. It's an opportunity for more science. It's an opportunity for more improvements, which will lead to other NBSs happening in other parts of the world. So it's a, we have to look at it. Uh, you know, there was a data point coming out about $700 billion uh, differential between what's needed now for biodiversity versus what will be needed in the future. In the first conversation, we had that uh, differential. That $700 billion that's need to be made, not just as a threat, that's the $700 billion that need to be made. Same way, the changes over time are opportunities for us to, you know, really hang on to really, it's not a point in time solution, it's a lifelong project. Uh, like most things, our buildings are not dead, they're lifelong projects. I, I keep saying, connecting back to that, it's lifelong. Yeah. You in the audience. Stuff and, Van Heilscher from uh, CV. I wanted to say in the word uh, nature or nature-based solution, nature is continuously evolving. And I think you need to copy that way. And maybe in response to what you said, um, it, it is true that when you, you should not see nature-based solutions as a new innovation, but you should maybe more look into restoration of it. I mean, during thousands of years, the best place for the wetlands to have new wetlands as a nature-based solution is where there were wetlands. When you have a, a channel, a river that is channeling, that's causing floods, and you just restore the meandering river, it, it's, it's a nature-based solution preventing floods, but it is sort of, it's a bit provocative not to say, only talk about innovation, but also about restoration and yeah. going back to the ways it was, and I think that's a, a good guidance there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the online audience? Draft, Giovanna. Come on, I know there's folks online. We want to hear from you. <laughs> In the room, anyone? 
Merlin, I see one behind you. Hi, sorry for question dominations from the host. Josh Weinberg, also from uh, Stockholm International Water Institute. Um, instead of a long soliloquy, maybe I will try to have uh, prod the panelists back to a point that you were making earlier. Um, you know, when we began, when during your lecture in the beginning, we talk a lot about really the issue we're talking about is how to scale, right? And we're talking about two different types of things at the same time. We're talking about how do you successfully implement local NBS projects, but then you're also talking about how do we systematically increase investment in NBS investments in nature. So the conversation's a little bit difficult <laughs> sometimes because sometimes we're talking about how do we save all the peatlands in the Congo as an NBS for climate, and sometimes we're talking about PES. But I think it would be nice for us to maybe return the conversation back to scaling, right? So how do we scale NBS as sort of a normalized procedure? Uh, so we're investing large scales and like with national governments for public investments, you know, or if it's within the corporate, if you guys can reflect a little bit about that. And then, okay, I lied about the soliloquy. But, uh, you know, there was the example from Cape Town is an excellent example of something that happened and why it's important, why it's obvious. But it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about really why we're having the seminar, which is when the valuation process of the nature-based solution is more complicated because there's a variety of benefits and there would be a variety of people who would pay for those benefits instead. So how do we get people to invest in NBS, you know, when, when we have the sort of more complex value proposition? Well, so Hannah, we, we started with Cape Town here. We're thinking yeah. about scale in terms of, you know, size of project, but also scale in terms of recognition of the wide range of beneficiaries. So, so what's currently happening with the Greater Cape Town Water Fund is it's transitioning to an independent entity so that it can uh, support its own sustainable financing mechanism and expand its implementation across the 24 catchments in the Western Cape water supply system, not just rely on the donor funding for the seven priority catchments. But the process of scaling is slow because it's built on the trust and understanding that's generated through the pilot projects. And in my experience, that's the only way I've seen nature-based solutions get scaled is the demonstration projects being adequately publicized and the information shared and the implementation knowledge and mechanisms shared to implement other demonstration projects that are context specific in those areas. But it is slow because it is context and NBS specific. Um, I guess the process of scaling to a bigger system level will follow the process of normalizing nature-based solutions. And I think that that acceptance is growing. So I guess all we can do is just contribute more to the knowledge base, be open with knowledge and evidence that gets generated, um, continue to share information amongst implementing partners. That's how I see it going. So you're part of the Nature for Water facility. Do you think that kind of a structure can help with this scaling? I'm going to exactly. talk about that a little bit. Thank you for letting me talk about the Nature for Water facility. So it's a partnership between Pegasus and the Nature Conservancy, and it's been set up as a technical assistance facility to design and implement watershed investment programs all over the world. So we have a donor funding to provide the technical assistance. We work with local partners in each of the basins uh, or catchments or watersheds or whatever call them in your part of the world. Um, and th because we're working simultaneously on engagements in lots of different places, the facility also acts as a platform to share knowledge across these projects. Oftentimes we're dealing with similar water security challenges, like the exact same specific water supply or water quality problem. Um, perhaps we're dealing with exactly the same nature-based solution, and so there's implementation lessons to share. And a big part of the Nature for Water facility is its knowledge and impact management. And so all of the learnings and uh, knowledge and 
um, communication of our methods and tools and analyses will all be um, open to the public for other people to learn from. Thank you. Peace. You're working on a USAID funded project and you know that has the potential to be some real money and think about real scaling. How does that fit into this conversation? Um, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, the project I'm working on is um, uh, we're focusing on uh, strengthening rural water quality in um, in developing countries. So uh, we're looking at um, having you know water equity, as, uh, everyone having access to safe you know safe water, and through that uh, we're working with the local local stakeholders. In uh, uh, for for now, the countries we are working in are. Uh, in West Africa, Ghana, and then in East Africa, it's Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. So it's more of like a proof of concept and uh, based on our findings, uh, we'd like it to be scaled to uh, different, uh, different uh, rural settings around the world. So for now, uh, we, 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 we're looking at having um, a central model where we're working with the already established uh, um, central laboratories to promote and strengthen uh, routine monitoring of uh, pipe water systems in these uh, rural, we could call them rural growth centers. So uh, we're looking at SDG 6.1 and how uh, Nature Based Solutions comes, comes in is that if we, if we conserve the source water, the headwaters, uh, the wetlands, it would, it would reduce on the treatment costs for most of these rural pipe systems because we know the cost of treatment when you have like more chemicals would make the cost of, uh, of the, the tariff of the water tariff high. So, nature-based solutions comes into play with if you if there's a if, if there's good source protection, it would also give access to you know cheap and clean uh, water for uh, rural communities. Yeah, that's that's what, that's what I would say in a nutshell. Thank you, Willem. You know you really emphasize the importance of of interfacing with local communities. So, how are you thinking about scaling? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we are in a challenging, challenging field here, because I think by definition, nature based means that you have to somehow respond to local communities. And that makes it a little bit difficult to say we found one nature based solutions and we can apply it everywhere and there's this one silver bullet and we are done. And I think we are looking at two aspects. And the first thing is, what do we want to do? And the second, and how do we organize the things? And how do we do the things? And I think what to do, that is where you come to the nature-based solutions do have to be local and they do have to be adjusted to local conditions if they are not we are basically again back to engineering a a blueprint to something that's that's not fit for that so i think there's always going to be a local situation but how do we organize things what is the knowledge base that we have of how do we fund all these kind of things I think I'm much more positive there. We are making huge steps, I think, towards scaling up things. And we have a lot of lessons that we are learning from other nature-based solutions and things like that. But we have to be careful not falling into the trap. This nature-based solution worked at location X. Now we transplant it to location Y, and it's going to work there as well. So. Yes, I'm very positive about what's happening with upscaling of nature-based solutions. And if you look at the last five years, maybe uh, nature-based solutions are mainstream, are being talked about, do have their place in, in, in the international community. That's great. But that doesn't mean now we have one um, template that we can use everywhere and we just rubber stamp nature-based solutions all over the world. That, that's never going to work. Harsh, I see you've also yeah. been writing furiously. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm, I'm responding to Joshua's question from, and, and there's something coming out of this conversation that adds to it. I think the financing of NBS as a part of scaling is not a availability question. It's not a problem of whether financing is available or not. I think it's like most things that we have recently been working with, it's about administration allocation disbursement you know, how do we identify programs? How do we identify projects? How do we invest in this? And that's where I'm saying that, yes, design has to be local. 
the development and implementation of nature based solutions it has to be local a great focus is on how life will change for people around that space but coming especially from corporate lens people outside of this basins watersheds are benefiting from this they also include an ecosystem of people who should pay for this and that's where i think financing can be released and it's because I hear this in, in a separate conversation, I hear a completely different picture. P people in our partnerships say that, well, we really want to put this money into nature-based solutions and XYZ programs. You don't have a presence there. And, and that saying that to WWF, which has a significant geographic coverage, is like, okay, that there, there seems to be a greater demand than supply. Uh, so we, we should be addressing that uh, with, you know, just providing more solutions. That I think also connects to what you have been saying about size. Yes, scaling NBS could be scaling size of NBS, but let's not undervalue the undervalue small NBS also, because I'll, we can put a ton of those together, create the traction necessary. They will represent far less complex and far less risky proposals, which is what I think market sentiment is all about that I've been referring to. If you can create a market sentiment, which, of course, we're not passing the information across locations, we're not saying that the same things apply in different places, but the learnings definitely do. The science is portable in that sense that we can build a much more rich portfolio through smaller NBS programs coming together, addressing a smaller stakeholder group, just getting started. Let's get started. The way forward is getting started, not thinking about it. I think well, that's where it is. That's, that is an excellent transition right there. Um, before we close the panel and move on to our closing remarks, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists to just for a single sentence on what it is, which opportunities and challenges you're really thinking about in terms of the way forward for valuing nature and nature-based solutions. Um, and I'll start online. And Willem, you're highlighted right now. So I'm going to start with you. OK. Um, what I think is the way forward for nature-based solutions is um, put yourself in the limelight of, OK, we can provide services that does, do improve livelihoods of people, that do address the problems that we are dealing with. And they are definitely a very, very, very useful tool in the in the toolbox of the water managers. And don't ever let nature-based solutions being sidelined by saying, oh, it's nature-based solutions. These are the tools that we need for dealing with future challenges, I would say. Thank you. Um, Peace, I'll move to you now for, this won't be the be all and end all, but one sentence on what you're thinking about yeah. about the way forward. Um, uh, what I'm thinking about the way forward is uh, building on the evidence base because uh, I think we're still uh, we're still at the start of it. We need to we, we need to have a robust data set, you know, to convince a lot of different stakeholders. So my my thing is that uh, I think we need to keep building and sharing the data. We need data transparency and just keep building the evidence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. On to you. For me. Uh, Implementing nature-based solutions in the water space relies so heavily on a multi-stakeholder governance and partnership platform or some way to connect people. And for me, that's very exciting because so many other opportunities come out of that when stakeholders form relationships and partnerships with each other. So that's exciting for me. Fabulous and harsh. I think there are no silver bullets for the whole thing, but nature-based solutions are the silver bullet for a set of things that we are really trying to address. They provide a, the opportunity really is that when we want to deal with climate, water, biodiversity, and all of those pieces together, well, you have one solution. It can do that. It can actually achieve multiple things. I think that's an opportunity. That's a silver bullet out there. All right. Well, please, a big hand for our panel. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And we'll end with some closing remarks from Samir Shishoda. He is the CEO of Rain Matter Foundation and has really been thinking about developing projects and building funding for all kinds of nature-based solutions. So Samir, on to you. He's online, so hopefully this will work. 
Yes, sir. Well, hey, thank you. Um, I apparently have only five minutes to do this, and I have about six pages of notes I've been taking over the last uh, couple of discussions. Um, it's it's going to be really tough. Uh, this seems like a really, really deep dive into our, uh, our thesis for climate change, uh, the way we are forming the view out of India. Um, right out of the bat, uh, Sergio mentioned the, the approach to no cookie cutters, and I think that's spot on, and it tied in well to how you uh, discuss the scale problem at the end. Uh, the need for it is very, very clear, as Sergio again pointed out. And uh, Kate, I think I thank you for uh, diving right into bringing complexity uh, into the limelight and the fact that, um, as Harsh uh, also pointed out later, that uh, the complexity of uh, of the real world needs to be reflected in how we look at the problems and then how we look at the solutions. Uh, because for for too far we have tried to uh, simplify it into single silos, single solutions. Like somebody said, uh, these are steps towards. Uh, solving the uh, larger interconnected problems that we have broken. Um, um, uh, Willem uh, identified livelihoods as a major area. And I think it's livelihoods, it's it's health, nutrition. Well, all of these intersections matter when we uh, think about nature-based solutions uh, and how they intersect with climate change as well. Because these, these this is a very dynamic, uh, complex set of systems. Uh, and we, 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 don't, we do not do it justice by looking at any one indicator. So to your point of how, what do we value, right? The, the, set of, the set of indicators that matter to us. And in fact, taking the indigenous view, taking the local view, I think uh, that point was brought out beautifully in the conversation. And this is something we need to look at from the places lens. You know, what, what indicators matter to the place and the people we are interacting with? Um, it is unlikely to be one indicator, so irrespective of what we are doing it with, we need to account for the bad trade-offs we might be uh, making in the process. And I think if we just make better trade-offs, we will fix a lot of problems we have ecologically and with the climate. Um, you also mentioned a, a very important uh, thing about not uh, shooting for perfection, but for a better version of where we are. So the directional push, uh, you know, ch checking for the right direction, checking for uh, a, a better version of where we are is, is what will lead to resilience. And it's, it's a major part of how you look at adaptation, for instance. And in India, climate is a very, very large adaptation problem. Um, somebody brought out the point about restoration, and I think um, that's that's super critical. If we, if we have to look at you know, nature is the solution. We are, we are, we are merely creating uh, small pockets of uh, components towards that solution uh, being restored to its, uh, its, its logical state. I think some of the points that we missed out on were the, was the idea of trade-offs that we actually uh, do better when we, when we adopt nature-based solutions over classical solutions. And, uh, the, the point about scale, I think, missed out on how policy, how philanthropy, how solutioning can actually create uh, multiple flexible endpoints and let local communities uh, absorb and uh, you know create a demand for what they see as the best fit for them, rather than it being an intervention-led approach. Because uh, all too often, we've, we've seen a lot of interventions get uh, pushed out there. Uh, but they do not sustain, um, they do not uh, last too long, or, or they end up causing a lot of other problems because there's no capacity or intent in the community to take it forward. Uh, but overall, I think these were a great bunch of sessions. I thank you all, Sergio um, and the team for picking up a great set of speakers, panelists, and it was a very, very invigorating discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samir. Let's give him a round of applause. And I will just follow up by saying thank you so much to the organizers of this session. Um, it's just a huge pleasure to see 
nature evaluation and NBS be such a focus of everything that's happening here at World Water Week. And I'm delighted to have been here. We had an amazing panel. Thank you to everyone in the in-person and online audience. And hopefully we can continue these conversations throughout the week and beyond. Um, enjoy your coffee. <laughs>